3. The False Prophet The false witness, which is banned by the Ninth Commandment, includes a false witness concerning God. In Deuteronomy 18, 9-22, we have not only a prophecy of Christ's coming, but also a test of false prophets. The law begins by banning certain forms of idolatry which are unlawful means of communication with the unseen world. No trick of magic, nor any kind of ritual, can coerce God. God does not reveal himself in answer to ritual or rite, nor does he prosper men in response to gifts and bribes. Instead of turning to these quote-unquote abominations, which only brought judgment on the Canaanites, Deuteronomy 18, 12, and 14, thou shalt be perfect or upright with the Lord thy God, Deuteronomy 18, 13. Rashi's comment is worth quoting, quote, Thou shalt walk with him in sincerity, and wait for him, and thou shalt not pry into the future. But whatsoever cometh upon thee, take it with simplicity, and then thou shalt be with him and be his portion." End quote. More important, however, is the fact that the purpose of these unlawful rites is prediction, the desire to know the future and to predict it. In a very central sense, the believer must walk by faith, not by sight. Precise and personal prediction and preview of the future is closed to him. In another sense, however, the law itself is given as the God-ordained means of prediction for a nation. The central purpose of Deuteronomy 27 through 31 is to provide the people of God with a true means of prediction, and that means of prediction is the law. If men disobey the law, certain curses ensue. If they obey the law, blessings result. Because the law is concerned with prediction, the people of God will avoid all lawless claims to prediction. The one principle of prediction is the sovereign power and decree of God. The other principle of prediction is the demonic power which seeks to establish an independent and revolutionary concept of power and control. The law was given through Moses, but the means whereby the law was given was terrifying to Israel and brought them close to the presence of judgment. God will therefore raise up another prophet, another Moses or lawgiver, and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Deuteronomy 18.18 18. The great prophet is thus given in terms of the original law and as the lawgiver. The key to the relationship of the prophet to Moses is the law. False prophets shall arise representing another god or power, and therefore another law. Their falsity will be revealed by their false predictions. Because the principle of true prediction is the law word of God, all the prophets, culminating in Jesus Christ, spoke, inspired of God, in terms of that law. Jeremiah, in prophesying the captivity, echoed the law prediction of Deuteronomy 27-31. Because he also spoke by God's inspiration, he could also declare that the captivity would last 70 years. Jeremiah 25-11 The key to the matter is the law. Where there is no law, there is no true prophecy, neither a true speaking for God, nor true prediction. Whenever and wherever Christians have become neglectful of the law, they have been easily and readily misled by charlatans. A classic example of this was Peregrinus Proteus, a Cynic philosopher who died in AD 165, but who has had his defenders among some modern philosophers, as well as among those of his era, like Aulus Skelius. The career of Peregrinus saw him in many areas, in Rome, from whence he was banned for an insult to Emperor Antonius Pius, in Athens as a teacher, in Syria where he was imprisoned, and so on. In his youth he wandered into Armenia with unhappy results, according to Lucian, quote, This creation and masterpiece of nature, this polycletan canon, as soon as he came of age, was taken in adultery in Armenia and got a sound thrashing, but finally jumped down from the roof and made his escape with a radish stopping his vent. Then he corrupted a handsome boy, and by paying 3,000 drachmas to the boy's parents, who were poor, bought himself off from being brought before the governor of the province of Asia. All this and the like of it I propose to pass over, for he was still unshapen clay, and our quote-unquote holy image had not yet been consummated for us. What he did to his father, however, is very well worth hearing, but you all know it. You have heard how he strangled the aged man, unable to tolerate his living beyond sixty years. Then, when the affair had been noised abroad, he condemned himself to exile and roamed about, going to one country after another." End quote. 
Peregrinus headed for Palestine and quickly associated himself with various antinomian Christians and became their, quote, prophet, cult leader, head of the synagogue, and everything, all by himself, end quote. He became to these people their new lord, quote, they revered him as a god, made use of him as a lawgiver, and set him down as a protector, next after that other, to be sure, whom they still worship, the man who was crucified in Palestine, because he introduced this new cult into the world, end quote. He came to be called the quote-unquote New Socrates. Peregrinus also picked up Hindu ideas and generally made himself into a kind of universal prophet. Imprisoned in Syria, he was liberally helped by the pseudo-Christians, and the Roman governor of the province freed Peregrinus as an unjustly persecuted philosopher. Peregrinus now had a professional garb. He wore his hair long, dressed in a dirty mantle, quote, had a wallet slung at his side, the staff was in his hand, and in general he was very histrionic in his getup, end quote. Returning to his home, a small Greek town, he found hostility there because of his murder of his father for the estate. Peregrinus gave the sizable estate to the town, and the murder charges were dropped. The people hailed him as, quote, the one and only philosopher, the one and only patriot, the one and only rival of Diogenes and Crates. His enemies were muzzled, and anyone who tried to mention the murder was at once pelted with stones, end quote. Later, he became objectionable to his pseudo-Christian following, and he sought new worlds to conquer by studying under a famous pagan ascetic, quote, Thereafter, he went away a third time to Egypt to visit Agathobulus, where he took that wonderful course of training in asceticism, shaving one half of his head, daubing his face with mud, and demonstrating what they call indifference by erecting his yard amid a thronging mob of bystanders, besides giving and taking blows on the backsides with a stalk of fennel and playing the mountebank even more audaciously in many other ways." End quote. He then went to Rome, was banished, went to Athens, and again stirred up trouble. Finally, with his reputation falling, he devised a publicity-provoking plan. At the next Olympic Games, a year away, he would burn himself up. Peregrinus was immediately in the limelight again. Some held that he hoped that his plans would be forbidden, because the site chosen was a holy place or near one. Peregrinus himself announced that he would, quote, become a guardian spirit of the night, it is plain, too, that he already covets altars and expects to be imaged in gold, end quote. On the appointed day for the pre-pyre funeral service, Peregrinus came out and in a long speech declared, I wish to benefit mankind by showing them the way in which one should despise death, end quote. Some cried out, preserve your life for the Greeks, but most shouted, carry out your purpose. When the games ended some days later, Peregrinus jumped into the flames. Lucian described him as, quote, a man who, to put it briefly, never fixed his gaze on the verities, but always did and said everything with a view of glory and the praise of the multitude, even to the extent of leaping into fire, when he was sure not to enjoy the praise because he could not hear it, end quote. The case of Peregrinus has been cited in some detail precisely because it is now, in average circles, non-controversial, and therefore illustrates readily the problem of antinomian religious leaders. They are, like Peregrinus, first of all, lawless antinomian men. There may be degrees of difference in their morality, but their basic character is the same. Second, instead of a zeal for the law word of God, there is a zeal for self-promotion and self-glory. There are many claimants to special revelations and a fresh word of prophecy. Thus, a 1970 advertisement spoke of the continuing quote-unquote campaign of one quote-unquote evangelist whose Sunday night subject was, quote, Jesus walked into my room and talked with me in Jerusalem, end quote. Can anyone imagine St. Paul conducting such a quote-unquote campaign? However, those who fail to teach the whole word of God are no less guilty of being false prophets. They who neglect the law have no gospel for they have denied the righteousness of God which is basic to the gospel. The death penalty is required for those who, quote, presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die, Deuteronomy 18.20. This law is in part responsible for the executions of heretics in the medieval and reformation eras, and these executions are now strongly condemned. Clearly, in most cases, these executions involved other presuppositions. Moreover, the point of this law was misconstrued. The heresies were often serious, and the executions were sometimes unjustified, 
but the law here does not deal with heresies or matters of doctrine, important as they are, but with predictive prophecy in terms of an alien or false god and law. Such predictive prophecy rested like the child sacrifice, witchcraft, magic, and related practices described at the beginning of this law, Deuteronomy 18, 9-14, on an anti-God faith, constituted treason to the society, and represented an alien and revolutionary law order. Their toleration is suicidal. Those who deliberately teach a revolutionary law order are traitors to the existing law order. Those who preach by cupidity, greed, or antinomian tendencies a defective view of scripture are also traitors, although not in the same sense or to the same degree. No society can escape penalizing those who vary from its fundamental faith. Marxist societies execute those who vary from or challenge its fundamental dogma. Socialist and democratic states are less severe, but they still execute traitors who give aid and comfort to the enemy. The fundamental religious presupposition of every society is either defended or the society perishes. In a Christian social order, it is not the ecclesiastical deviations which must be the civil concern, but rather the challenges to its law structure. To permit revolution is to perish. Toleration is due to differences within a law system, but not to those dedicated to overthrowing the law system. Rome, in persecuting the early church, was trying to preserve its law order. The emperors clearly saw the issue, Christ or Caesar. Their moral and religious premise was false, but their civil intelligence was sound. Either the pagan empire or the church had to die. They failed to see that the empire was already dying, and that the death of Christians would not save Rome's failing life. It was Constantine's grasp of this fact that led to the recognition of Christianity. The relationship of the various kinds of false prediction, witchcraft, magic, spiritualism, etc., to subversion deserves extensive study. It is no coincidence that May Day, the ancient fertility cult festival of witches, has repeatedly been a day of central importance to revolutionaries, as witness the Marxists. The anti-Christian lawyers who celebrate it as quote-unquote law day have an anti-Christian law in mind.